Hello. I guess I just blew you all a kiss. So, um, hello. Thanks for joining us. And my name's Jill, and I'm a Dharma teacher with True North Insight. And we're happy that you're here to practice with us on the YouTube channel and for folks that are here in person on Zoom. It feels uh, feels like in person now to have real beings here interacting. Um, a while back on the YouTube channel and here in the this group, we were talking about a, an overview of the Eightfold, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, the Middle Way. And I made a little chart as a summary for folks and um, and out of that, there came some questions that we've been reflecting on. Um, and one of them that we haven't uh, talked about specifically is um, is tonight's topic, which is karma. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> karma. It's a, this is a Sanskrit word, K-A-R-M-A. And in Pali, the language of the Dharma, and, or the, when, no, the language that the Dharma was first brought into written form from the oral tradition, it was in Pali language, and as far as we know. And so in Pali, karma is kama, K-A-M-M-A. -M -M so uh, I try to use the Pali words when I can, but I might slip back and forth because karma is the most, mm, mm, what we're more familiar with. And so this came up in terms of the four ennobling truths that the Buddha awoke to. How far back should I go? Let's see. <laughs> Not too far. So when the Buddha um, experienced enlightenment and liberation that's another topic we should cover what that means um one of the things well he woke to one of the things he awoke to was the middle way between the two extremes of the life of luxury and delight and pursuing comfort and um, pleasure as much as possible. And then the other extreme that he lived uh, when he left that life of extreme renunciation and uh, ascetic, is that hard word to say, ascetic practices where he almost died from them of extreme fasting and yogic pranayama practices. And just before dying, he realized that he still hadn't awoken and, and understood the ending of suffering, realized, pardon me, the ending of suffering. And so he found the middle way where he nurtured the body and, you know, we have these requisites for practice where we, you know, to have safe housing, to have nourishing food in appropriate amount, to have medicine if it's needed, and clothing to protect the body. So when he took this middle path of, uh, then he was able to really practice well and um, to fruition. And then he awoke to what are called the four noble truths, usually. There's lots to be said about that translation, but we'll just say the four ennobling truths, the truths that um, uh, are ennobling, are uplifting and onward leading. Um, so these are, in brief, that the truth of Dukkha, another Pali word, D-U-K-K-H-A, which means uh, 
one of the books I'm currently reading translated as dissatisfaction, which is good. But uh, it, it's this huge range of experience all the way from mild dissatisfaction, just not liking how things are, um, how people are, how we are, uh, all the way through to stress and anxiety and all the way continuing to extreme um, despair is a good one. So um, part of this embodied experience of life includes aging, sickness, death, losing what we want to keep, not being able to get rid of what we don't want. And he also realized that there is a cause for dukkha. And it's not all those things and all those people and all those conditions that we're constantly trying to control. Those continue to happen and are unpleasant at times. And But it's it's what we do with these natural arisings and passings if we cling to them. Clinging is the same as pushing. We get our hands on it and we're either trying to get rid of something or hold on to something or some thought or some idea or some body, etc. Understanding that there was a cause for clinging, he could also then realize that there's a can be an ending, which is the third noble truth. If there's a cause for something to arise, if you take away the cause, it won't arise. Cause and effect. And so, if we don't cling, there, ca there can be an ending of dukkha. It's called kanika marana. Um, these momentary releases. Um, no, that's momentary death, Kanika Marana. Kanika means momentary. So I that was wrong Pali there. Okay, third noble truth is that if we take away clinging, it can, then Dukkha won't arise. And then the fourth ennobling truth is the what's called the middle path, the eightfold noble path, which is the way to the ending of dukkha. There, that's just context. <laughs> the first of the eightfold noble path, the way to the ending of dukkha, is called wise view. Wise view. And uh, there's two aspects of wise view. Wise meaning onward leading, meaning sometimes it's called right view. It's not so much about right and wrong or in some sort of being judged by some uh, outer source, but uh, wise or skillful onward leading view. In that, there were two parts. The one kind of circles back on itself. The first Wise view is the, the beginning to understand or the understanding of these four noble truths. Um, you know, even just hearing them or some curiosity about it or some, you know, some sense of an understanding is a beginning of wise view. And of course, there's more and more to understand and deeper, deeper, deeper levels of understanding. The second part of wise view is the understanding of kama or karma in Sanskrit. And this we haven't really talked about in depth yet. So here we are. That was context. <laughs> this week I was reading a newsletter from hospice where I volunteer and um, it said, when spring arrives, I always wish I had planted bulbs in the fall. <laughs> That's a good karma message. <laughs> what bulbs, what seeds are we planting? 
to bring what fruits, what results, what cause and effect. You know, when, and, and to, yeah, the, there's a lot in this little quote. When spring arrives, I always wish I had planted bulbs in the fall. And it's it's kind of hinting at this mm, understanding of, of karma. I mean, they're not talking about karma, obviously, but uh, of seeds and what seeds we nourish and what fruits, what growth may come from those seeds. And this reminded me of um, this uh, book, which we're doing in a study group uh, called Home is Here by Reverend Leanne Shoot. And uh, it's practicing anti-racism with the engaged Eightfold Path, the Noble Eightfold Path that we're talking about right, right now, the first part of it. And uh, I'll put a link in the YouTube recording to, to this book. I did a year-long uh, study program with Reverend Leanne on, on this Eightfold Path of anti-racism. <laughs> and uh, so in this uh, book, Reverend Leanne Shoot, um gives a, a really lovely description here of karma. And I'll just use her, her words. She says, in the teachings, the image of seeds in a field offers a way to understand karma and how it works. The kinds of seeds that are in the field are based on causes from the past. Certain seeds are more likely to sprout than others due to the present conditions, such as how much rain and sun the field receives. She says, I like to think of volitional action. So this means our intentional um, actions as free will. Each person has to respond to the seeds that are already in our gardens as well as the free will each person has to respond to or add to the present conditions affecting their garden. For instance, a wise vegetable gardener, gardener knows that tomatoes need and so knows what tomatoes need and so will plant seeds in a sunny spot. However, as any gardener knows, if you plant a seed, you're not, necessar not necessarily going to get an exact kind of plant shown on the seed packet or any description you've read about the plant. There are many factors that will influence the plant's size, strength, longevity, and even color. With tomatoes, they like the sun, but if it's also being planted in a very hot climate, a dappled shade spot may be best. And she says, this is true in life as well. Karma is not as simple and direct as A leads to B, which leads to C. There are many causes and conditions. And we can't always know what the future impact results will be. It's not a linear um, it's not linear, period. <laughs> In a way, then, um, we can settle into this not knowing as a practice of focusing more on the possibilities for interconnection, the force that shows us wholeness. So this image of seeds is a, a really helpful one because mm, the kinds of seeds within this heart, body, mind Uh, are here from past infinite causes and conditions. Infinite. <laughs> mm. And not all of these seeds will come to fruition. Some will kind of stay dormant in, in the mind and even in the body. Um, and others will 
will sprout. And we don't really know exactly what form they will take. Um, and it really depends on what's what is happening in the present moment and our response. What we, what, how we respond. Um, so it's like, uh, like this. Um, I want to confuse the images, so I'll go here. Uh, so on the Fake Buddha Quotes website, which I'll also put a link down below, really fun site. I love that it exists <laughs> because I do get annoyed by fake Buddha quotes. This is one that is a fake Buddha quote. Um, quote, everything that happens to us is the result of what we ourselves have thought, said, or done. We alone are responsible for our lives. No. <laughs> this is not in the suttas. This is not what the Buddha taught. In fact, um, he spoke out against this. But, you know, we have, this is a common idea that gets bandied about, about karma, that it's like, you know, and we even say it kind of in a joking way, like, oh, that's their karma, or, or, like, it becomes victim blaming, is what it becomes. Something bad is happening to somebody, it's like, well, that must have been their karma. No, please, no, this is incorrect. Okay, so the early scriptures, or mm, suttas, the the teachings of the Dharma from the Buddha. Um, this is a view that is argued against. And in the Majjhima Nikaya 101, this is a, a sutta for those that are interested in reading them. Uh, it's, it says this, it is not proper for you, the Buddha is speaking in this teaching, it's not proper for you to assert that Quote, whatever a person experiences, pleasure, pain, or neither pleasure nor pain, all is caused by what was done in the past. The Buddha is saying that is a false view. Okay, because it's more like this. So picture uh, a still pond and each thought even thoughts, word, speech, actions, is like a little pebble thrown into the pond. And, of course, it causes ripples. The thoughts, speech, and actions that this being does has a ripple, uh, an effect within me. It also has a cause and effect within my own system, but it also affects others. It ripples out in ways that I cannot foresee. Now, that's every thought, action, and speech is ping, 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 ping. Lots of ripples. And some of them are big. Now, picture every other being. Let's just talk about us that are here on this uh, practice together. And all of our thoughts, speech, and actions also are pebbles in the pond. So all of our ripples are affecting each other. And infinite contacts that we can't even be aware of. Effects on the earth, effects with each other, effects with unknown beings. Every time, like everything, it has, we're all interrelated and affecting each other. And so you can see that there's nothing linear in that. 
it's not like everything that happens to me is because of everything I've done in, in the past, just coming back just to me. This is not, we're completely interconnected beings. And so mm, it's, it's much more complex than that. Um, so it's not so, karma is not so much about what comes to us. This is where we tend to focus on that part, like that's their karma, good or bad. We're like, eh, that's their karma. But it's more about what we do with it in every moment. Whatever is arising, either from karmic seeds or from external causes and conditions, which may also be arising from karma, is what how we respond with what's arising, what we do with it. This is more important because now we are having volitional action, a volitional intentional responses and mm, that are causing other ripples. And this is where we can bring in our morality, our wise speech, our wise effort, our wise, et cetera, the rest of the path so that we are con not causing harm. Of course, often harm happens unintentionally, but not, not intentional harm <clears throat> um, and creating more harmful karma for ourselves and harm to others. Hmm. Um, Uh, Gil Fronsdale is the one that shared that description of the pebbles in the pond, which I found super helpful, <laughs> really helpful. And I love this uh, analogy of the seeds is helpful for us to understand that not everything comes to fruition. Some seeds stay dormant, and it's really what we're doing with it in the present moment that is... Um, most important not to use it as some sort of a tendency that leads to blaming the victim which is not not very buddhist <laughs> if i may say tempted to talk about rebirth and reincarnation in relation to kama but that's going to be another talk i think because that's another aspect of karma which is very important and people have lots of curiosity about rebirth or uh, what is sometimes called reincarnation and these are different things and it is very much related to karma so that's gonna have to be next time note to self let's hope i remember Next week, though, I want to do Earth Day. So I'll put a big post-it note here saying come back to that one. Because I've got my, my tools here to do it, but uh, to show you. Uh, and I find it super fascinating. I've been studying it a little bit. So two weeks time, we'll talk about that. <laughs> Bring your questions. All right, so to review, maybe... The first part of the Eightfold Noble Path, the way to the ending of Dukkha, is first of all having some sense or a deeper understanding of the Four Noble Truths. And the second part of wise view is the understanding of Kama. And um, hopefully there's been some nuggets in here for you to begin to have some curiosity or a sense of what karma means i know i'm aware i keep changing between pali and sanskrit but hopefully you're okay with that um not to use it as a way to blame ourselves or to blame others oh that's just my bad karma or yours or my good karma you know like 
it, because it's way more interconnected and complex than that. And what is arising in this present moment? Ah, this I have an effect on. What I do with this? Do I just let it steamroll and project onto others or let myself act out in harmful ways? Or um, do I use the rest of the path? The path begins with wise view and then wise intention, which leads to skillful thoughts, skillful speech, action, livelihood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Li livelihood, um, and then wise mindfulness, wise effort, wise concentration. I missed one in there. It's on the chart. Look back at the one on the Eightfold Noble Path. I'm not going to suffer about it right now. It's not what matters. We want to focus on a little bit of an introduction and understanding of karma. And then we'll go back at it to see how it affects Dying consciousness and rebirth consciousness. So interesting and fun. Dharma nerd. All right. So that's enough talking. And more importantly, practicing. So now we will have a meditation practice together and let all those words just fly out the window and let what lands land without trying to hold on to it. Okay, so adjust your posture and hmm. pardon me. Oh, it's my water. Find a supportive and upright posture. Take some time to see if you need any other supports or comfort so that you can really come into present moment with some kindness. If you need any stretches or dimming your lights or turning away from the computer. Hmm. And then... See if some sighing breaths are helpful, taking a few slightly deeper breaths. And a longer sighing release. And then find a posture for the eyes that feels supportive for you, whether it's downward or closed or just slightly open and resting down. Letting go of some outer distractions. And then letting the breath return to a natural breath. Trusting that the body knows how to breathe itself. But there may still be a feeling of not so much controlling the breath, but a feeling of sighing, any tension, just starting to relax, soften, settle. So the muscles of the face become wide and relaxing. The bone of the lower jaw, heavy. It's 
sides of the neck lengthening and the back of the neck lengthening as the shoulder bones drop down. Seeing if there's any tension in the areas of the heart center or belly center that could soften or release a little bit. I tend to practice fairly often with a, what Stephen Jenkins calls soft belly meditation. Stephen Levine, pardon me, soft belly meditation. The inner layers of the belly that tend to contract when we're activated and fearful and tense and helps the whole nervous system to settle down. So that now we might feel a bit more weighted or connected to the sensations of the ground. Hips, legs, feet, or if you're laying down, the back body. And one of the things that conditions skillful comma in the present moment and affecting future moments is our ethics, our values, our sila, as it's called in the Dharma. So you might take some time to reflect on what are your personal values of how you want to be in the world and with yourself. In the Dharma, we often uh, recall and practice with the training to refrain from causing harm or taking life. Refrain from taking what isn't freely given, so non, not stealing. Refrain from causing harm with our sensuality or sexuality. Refrain from causing harm from with our speech or uh, lying, telling falsehoods. And the intention to refrain from being unmindful or heedless from intoxicants. So recall your intentions and feel how they um, cultivate skillful seeds taking root. We'll take a few moments in silence together with this reflection and practice before we continue.
And then rather than focusing on uh, what was or was not planted in the past to see what seeds we want to plant or cultivate or nourish in our own heart mind, the chitta, the aware heart. In this moment, and for the causes and conditions of future moments. And so now we'll let our attention turn towards an anchor, cultivating some calm and stability by choosing an anchor for the, the remainder of this practice. You might choose your breath, feeling the sensations of the breath as your anchor. Or if you have another anchor you're used to working with, it could be hearing or the sensations of the body. So now just letting yourself, whatever is naturally arising, just let that be the anchor for the remainder of this practice. And then gently begin to turn up the curiosity, Dhamma Vichaya, with this anchor. Are we paying attention to the whole length of the sound or the sensation or the breath? Paying attention to its arising and passing. So we'll be silent together and continue for a few minutes. Really lots of curiosity and attention with your anchor. And we bring this energy and curiosity to the anchor, 
so that we have a ground of attention on which to notice either the arising and passing of either dukkha and its ending so we can see when we're clinging to a thought or pushing away a sound pushing away a sensation and we can also see its natural release when we allow these arisings to pass without pushing or holding on this is practicing with the four noble truths So continue to rest with the full experience of your anchor so that you can notice when attention lifts off of the anchor without quickly coming back to it. Take a moment to notice, oh, what was being clung to there or pushed away or held on to. And then we release our grip on it and begin again. Notice what thoughts were arising and if there was any holding on or pushing away to some story that usually involves ourselves. And then gently begin again. If you're experiencing a lot of sleepiness or dullness, turn up the curiosity with your anchor. Are you experiencing the whole length of the breath or the sound or sensation? Turn up the brightness without adding tension.
Begin these last few minutes of the practice. I'll slowly read Reverend Leanne's image of the seeds in the field as a way to understand karma and how it works. The kinds of seeds that are in the field or in this being are based on infinite causes and conditions from the past. And some seeds, certain seeds are more likely to sprout than others due to present conditions, such as how much rain or sun the field receives. or the present conditions of our own lives, what seeds are more likely to sprout. And then we each have our own intentional actions, our free will to respond to seeds that are already in our gardens, in our heart-mind. And our intentional actions to respond to or add to the present conditions affecting the garden of our heart-mind. And if you like, you might end your practice by circling back to your intentions, your values, your ethics. Feel and see these skillful, onward-leading seeds that you're nurturing by your presence here, your practice, your compassionate attention, your cultivation of stillness and calm, curiosity.
May we all awaken to the understanding of causes and conditions, to the understanding of dukkha and the ending of dukkha. And may we continue to nourish and water the seeds of kindness and peace and freedom for all beings everywhere. Thank you for your practice. And um, so next week will be a Earth Day Elements meditation uh, uh, on Wednesday here on Zoom and our usual time. And then the one after that, I'll try to circle back to, to this and uh, a little bit further. <laughs> Thanks for joining us.